Who's ready for some ass? We're here in Landlock, Colorado. Teaching kids to scuba dive and the importance of marine science and ocean conservation. Through a scholarship of a lifetime. back in the pool at Ocean First to finish off our weekend of SSI scuba training. Let's go! What I'd like to do is have you guys do another giant stride today, go down on the line to the deep end, Claire and I will come to each of you and review a couple of the skills. So you do one mass skill, one regulator clearing skill, and one regulator retrieval skill. Then we'll just play around in the deep end, swim up to the shallow end, and do some new skills. How does that sound? Everyone feel comfortable with that? So by this point, the kids are discovering the potential problems and working out the solutions on their own. My jaw kind of was like hurting um, after diving, which I just think is really interesting to know because um, having a regulator really does kind of affect how you, not only how you breathe, but afterwards. And there's just soreness in my jaw from having it in my mouth the entire time. I mainly do, you know, sports out of the water. <laughs> so I usually breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth, and then it was all through my mouth, which was weird for me. My hardest challenge in the pool so far has probably been just getting used to like breathing through equipment and um, I guess like just don't panic, just relax and it's easier if you just kind of relax and just don't worry about it and have fun and enjoy it. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about the history of diving, compasses and computers. So what were the very first snorkeling devices? What did people use to go snorkeling back, back in the day? Did they use empty reed tubes? Yeah, they use reeds. What's the limiting factor with reeds? They wear out quickly. Well, they would wear out, but what else? Can you have a reed that's like 30 feet long? No. The air pressure would not be able to get down that far. What does scuba stand for? Self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Good. Learning a little bit about the history of diving is not only interesting, but it also could prove to be helpful when they get to their test. Get your regulators out. Go ahead and turn your information systems over so you guys can see the compass between the both of you. You also have what's called the lever line, the double red line, so that when you're going to set your course, you would use the lever line to set your course. So you, now you guys move your bezel so that zero or 180 is at north. So if you guys were to swim north, you would want to swim so that you're sort of I like visualize it as I'm swimming between my lever lines. Once you set your bezel, you don't want to change it. Because if you twist it, yeah, you're going to end up <laughs> really off. Even though you think you only moved it a nut, like a notch, you didn't. You moved it like five miles. You guys are going to take your regulators outside. You're going to hold it so that you can see it. Now remember, you're going to hold it in your midline. When we get outside, you guys are going to set your course. One of you is going to be directing, one of you is going to be reading the compass, and then you're going to do a reciprocal heading and come back, then you're going to switch. We'll do this a couple times outside. Well, this is new. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to switch. Megan's going to go down to that end. Now, if you were hopping off of a boat and going out from a boat, you would want to know where you started from, and that's where you set the bezels. Navigation is so important. It's easy to get completely turned around underwater. So this is a skill we definitely want to learn and we want to practice on land first. And that's where once you set that bezel, don't touch it. The boat didn't move. Think of it as a, a spokes from a wheel. If the boat is the center spoke, you can go out in any direction from the boat, but you just need to know what direction it is you're headed out at. For brand new masks, so there's a little film on the inside of a mask that uh, 
makes it fog really easily right when you get it. You should either rub it with some toothpaste or a torch and try to get that initial layer off so that the kids don't have a hard time seeing in the water. There's very few things as frustrating as diving with a super foggy mask, so. Okay. Good job, this clear. All right, here we go. <laughs> There's nothing. Oh, yeah. So you can kind of see there's like a light film in there that sort of fogs up when the flame touches it. Alright, luckily this seems more or less foolproof. <laughs> but luck, fortunately for me. My goggles are fixed. Nope, it's a mask. Let's try that again. My mask is finally fixed. So after diving this past weekend, I tried a couple of different things, but my mask is no longer fogging up nearly as much as it used to. So I'm really, really excited about that. So I think the most important and most interesting thing about just diving and that is exploring like the world's last frontier and just the water and fish and sharks and all that. I think that's really cool and I can't wait for that um, in Florida. And then second most important is definitely just maintaining gear and knowing how to use it and if you take care of your gear it'll take care of you. Yeah. end of the pool, but now we have some scuba skills to practice too.
approval can be a difficult skill to get used to and a little unnerving for some, but it's a vital skill as a diver, one you're sure to use, and it can help prevent panic underwater. I'm happy to say all the kids did awesome. So you want to make sure that your dive buddy is positively buoyant. You don't want your dive buddy sinking. You also want to make sure you are positively buoyant so that you aren't having to swim through the water. You try not to kill yourself. Up. I'm so tired. And I'm going to tow her to the boat. All right, now we're ready to learn some important skills on how to help out your dive buddy. This is where they learn how to properly tow a tired diver at the surface. Thing we're gonna do today is work on our buoyancy skills and really just practicing and learning to find neutral buoyancy that sweet spot perfect spot where you're not floating up to the surface or crashing down to the bottom if you find that you're moving up and you're coming up too high exhale for the count of ten But other than that, that was like probably the hardest part. Yeah, I'm getting a lot more comfortable with the whole like, gear and having something attached to me. Doing the mask clears, like not panicking when it gets in, because it, it can't really do anything to you unless you panic. So just like being calm, being like everything's fine, and putting it back on, and doing everything you know. It was really fun. I'm really glad to be under the water. Yeah. Um, to, get, to be able to do it another time and get to learn some new skills is great. It's amazing. That mask issue was kind of concerning me because although I had fun and tried not to let it distract me, having to re-clear my mask every couple of minutes was a little bit frustrating. However, if I spit in it before we go in and then rinse it off and put the mask on but don't take it off anymore, it seems to work perfectly fine and it won't fog up. So I'm super excited about that and overall this experience has only only gotten better and I just can't wait for what's to come. So Florida is only two months away. We're in April, middle of April, May, June. Boom, we're gone. Cannot wait. It's going to be epic. Next episode, we are hanging out and spending some time with Josh, Emily, and Fatima, checking in to see how the scuba training is going for each of them. We'll see you next time.